Leadership at Middlesex University. Jane's present methodologies and research practices are framed by feminist new materialism. Through her work, she seeks to maintain uh, concern with issues of social justice and to critically engage with early childhood policy, curricula, frameworks, and pedagogical approaches. She pursues approaches that extend understandings of the workforce, families, the child, and childhood in early years contexts. I'm personally very excited to welcome Jane along. She's someone who I've been, uh, you know, studying as a student on my undergraduate degrees and sort of following in more recent times as she's been doing lots of work around new materialism. Uh, this event as a whole, it's been in the planning since 2019, of course. Um, COVID-19 prevented it from happening last year, so we're very happy to welcome Jane along to our event today. Jane, I'm going to hand over to you now and stop sharing my screen. Great. Okay, well, thank you so much for that welcome and introduction. And it really is great to be here, um, given the circumstances. A, co um, a pandemic couldn't put us off and the sunny weather won't put us off. We'll keep going regardless. So I'll just pop up my um, presentation. I may go a little bit over 25 minutes, um, but I'm hoping that's kind of okay because there's some, some wiggle room as it is, um, as they say. So um, yeah, I was really, really delighted to be involved invited to present um, my work at the um, Scottish Education Research Association Network. Um, and um, I suppose when uh, Shadai proposed the topic, I was thinking, gosh, um, which, which bit of my work and how does it fit? And um, I suppose playfulness is, I think, kind of central to feminist new materialist approaches and particularly the work of Haraway. She talks about serious play. And um, where I'm coming from is to think about play and to think mm -hmm. about research and to think about scholarship as more than only human endeavors. That's not to say the human is obviously um, um, an active participant um, in all of those things, but um, really what happens if we change our frame, if we change our lens and our optics and we start to think about play and research and early childhood and the child in different posthumanist ways. And that's what I want to share with you today. Um, so what I do in this paper is to turn to everyday habits, just ordinary stuff that unfolds within the nursery, mundane materials in early childhood context. And what I'm attempting to do is to move beyond only critiquing, which is something that I've done a lot in my previous work, is to deconstruct policy and to critique practice and to critique curriculum frameworks and so on. And that is still valid and valuable work. And I'm not suggesting that doesn't need to be done. But what happens if we attempt to move beyond that? Um, and in order to do that, I'm, I'm mobilising a feminist new materialist framework in my work. Um, and what I want to do is to offer you an illustration of how this makes thinking about our relational entanglements in early childhood more expansive. So I'm offering um, a speculative account of what Donna Haraway's figure of the mutated modest witness and her practice of situated knowledges makes possible. And I argue that rather than diminishing humanist concerns, this framework actually offers the means to exercise heightened ethical responsibility, what she terms a worldly responsibility, where the researcher becomes attuned to so much more than only human actors in any given scenario. So this approach celebrates what feminist new materialism offers to generate new ways to think about and be in the world, hence the worldliness. So following Haraway, um, I want to argue for a successor science that reworks ideas, ideas that are very well known in the field of research about observation and about research objectivity and that recognises and indeed celebrates a researcher's place as entangled and implicated. We're never separate from that which we research. So for the mutated modest witness, matters of a con concern are encountered, sensed and indeed produced through haptic moments in early childhood, the everyday, the ordinary, the mundane I was talking about at the beginning. So researching in this mode insists that we go beyond re presentation or giving voice towards being in the thick of things and actively participating in world-making processes. 
I find this quote from um, Carol Taylor and Gabrielle Ivanson particularly helpful. I often use it because I think it does really um, give a sense of what new, feminist new materialism is, is attempting to do, which is this um, recognising that we have no bird's eye position. We can't look back or down on the world. We're in the thick of it and we have to take that seriously. Our own messy, implicated, connected in body involvement in knowledge production. So the promises offered by feminist new materialism has invited me to consider how else research might be undertaken in more socially engaged, generative and potentially hopeful ways. Consequently, what counts as research and what counts as valid knowledge and what gets included within frames of inquiry have become considerably rethought. So putting feminist new materialism to work has invited a more entangled and immersed approach to research that insists I recognise my relational entanglements in early childhood context and that the concern is not to capture accounts that represent what I think I see or what I think I know, but rather it's this embracing uncertainty and not knowing new knowledges and practices start to emerge. So I've been grappling with what going beyond the human subject and bringing materiality and affect more forcibly into the frame of my investigations might mean for politically re motivated research, research concerned with so social inequalities. As a feminist researcher, I remain troubled by inequalities of all kinds that persist in capitalist patriarchal systems sexism, racism, class prejudice, all humanist issues that have a very real bearing on experiences of childhood and therefore concerns that I want to keep central to my work. Yet feminist new materialism makes clear the limits of human exceptionalism. It's not only enough to attend to humanist matters of concerns, we have an ethical responsibility to recognise and take account of our entangled place in the world. Not everything is about the human. We can bring this sensibility into our everyday lives and to the research that we undertake with children and their entanglements with spaces, materials, memories, affects, bodies, sounds, smells and so on in a quest for what Haraway terms more livable worlds. I report on a study which seeks, uh, that seeks to reconfigure approaches to studying diversity in early childhood, with a heightened ethical responsibility, a worldly responsibility. So as a researcher, I must be attuned to so much more than only the human actors in any given scenario. Taking a small number of embodied material affective events and moments from one London nursery and making my starting place materiality, I offer a generative account of seeking to work with the figure of the mutated modest witness. For Haraway, modest witnessing is about reworking and mutating established ideas and practices about how to do science or how to do research. Her figure of the mutated modest witness is a practice of critical scholarship that involves our own as well as other bodies, materialities, knowledges, politics, ethics and truths. And crucially, she argues, it's a hopeful practice. In her groundbreaking essay, I'm not quite sure whether I'm on the right slide. Yes, I am. OK, <laughs> so in her groundbreaking essay uh, from 1997, Haraway playfully attempts to refigure science's masculine modest witness. She is commi committed to reworking what she terms polluted histories and practices, namely claims to objectivity achieved through embodied presence of scientists as witness, as bearing testament to truth knowledge production, what she terms the God trick. Yeah. In Modest Witness, Haraway presents a robust critique of modern experimental science as it was performed in, um, in traditional scientific approaches. So accepting this model of scientific practice permits a limited version of objectivity as beyond question, since it's both universal and given to nature. 
Haraway is at pains to deconstruct this narrative in order to imagine a more critical science committed to situated knowledges. And this is different from standpoint perspective, which we can go on to discuss in the, uh, the Q&A. Um, but it's a, it's a practice of credible witnessing that, that still remains in place. So for Haraway, situated knowledges enable partial perspective that produce strong objectivities. And these are features of the successor science she argues for, a science framed by feminist politics. Haraway's uh, mutated modest witness is a project of reworking knowledge, perspective, objectivity and truth. She contests how science is framed, practiced and its relevance in real worlds from which it emerges and to which it is always connected. She argues that witnessing and modesty are practices too important to leave out of science project, but the point is to figure out what each might mean in a successor science that would take democracy, freedom, partiality, location and accountability more seriously. So a feminist modesty then requires asking difficult questions about race, class, gender and sex with the goal of making a difference in the world. Haraway's success as science and figure of the mutated modest witness works against the god trick. She argues for feminist objectivity characterised by situated knowledges, that is about knowing, seeing, witnessing, attesting, speaking as a particular body that is located in a particular time and place, both literally and relationally. This reworked, remodelled conceptualisation of objectivity is never innocent or unproblematic because it is always partial, situated, located and therefore accountable. Our seeing, sensing and being in the world is always located, active and specific and recognising this allows for more truthful knowledge of worlds to emerge. So Haraway's concept of worlding um, in her more current work, um, 2008 and 2016, stresses that worlds are multiple, partial, located, contradictory, overlapping, messy and always in process. And this is what I'm trying to get at through feminist new materialist approaches to studying play in early childhood contexts. Um, we can do this, she argues, by exercising loving care and response ability, our ability to respond to the ethics in any given situation. And that involves paying careful, loving attention to how others see, hear and know, all of which is central to a better way of doing science. OK. So with this theoretical framing in place, I seek to illustrate how the figure of the mutated modest witness and practices of feminist objectivity can find expression to stretch and rework ideas and practices surrounding um, early childhood. As Haraway states, sorry, I'm a bit ahead of myself, um, in her SF philosophy, again, I don't have time to unpack her SF philosophy because it is an entire philosophy, <laughs> but it, it encapsulates much of, of her, um, her project, if you like. So SF, to quote her, is a methodological proposal. It is a toolkit for thinking, feeling, storying, relating to be taken up, used, modified, offered, shared, whatever. So what I'm doing is I'm taking up this methodological proposal offered by Haraway as a means to attempt research differently in a way that allows for feminist objectivity, partial perspectives and situated knowledges to generate other stories about childhood. So the partial situated location of this investigation unfolds within the toddler room in a North London nursery on a damp and drizzly Wednesday afternoon in December. Ladybird room is another worldly space, a dwelling, a pedagogical home occupied by three and four year old children, adult educators and a host of non-human and more than human agents. A look around Ladybird room reveals it to be all too familiar to the early childhood researcher. However, engaging practices of mutated modest witnessing refigures it as a sensorium rich with possibilities to tell otherworldly stories about childhood. 
Through its familiarity, the space and all its inhabitants become extraordinary and offer endless possibilities to reimagine early childhood education and how um, that might be encountered differently through a process ontology. Observing the routine, everyday, material discursive entanglements unfolding and enfolding within the room creates space for other stories to emerge in unexpected and unanticipated ways. Through socially engaged practices of deep hanging out and a willingness to venture off the beaten path, I am presented with multiple sticky knots with which to reconfigure ideas and practices about early childhood education and childhood. So exercising an open-ended speculative approach to research in early childhood education is difficult to explain to the staff. So when I arrive at the nursery, I'm immediately taken to um, wall displays of maps of the world to tell me about the, the diversity and richness of the, um, the, 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 the population um, of children who attend the nursery. And um, yeah, this map of the world with photos of children's faces are superimposed upon the country from which their families originated. Then a chart displaying all the language, languages spoken and various photo displays of children engaged in learning about other cultures. And then I'm gifted a copy of the outstanding Ofsted report that provides further evidence of the ways in which the nursery facilitates and embraces multiculturalism. And finally, an information sheet that's been prepared by a parent about festivals and celebrations at home. So whilst these artefacts and accounts volunteered by staff are interesting representations, my concern is to engage in practices of mutated modest witnessing so that I might sense, hear, smell, see multiculturalism as it manifests through everyday encounters and play events and microscopic events that unfold in the everyday routine, habitual comings and goings of the nursery. So my core questions are what else and what if? And this is um, in, in, inspired by Erin Manning amongst other post-humanist and feminist new materialists, so opening out our inquiries and being open to surprises. So I want to go on to share um, so an extract from my field notes where my own, as well as other bodies, materialities, knowledges, politics, ethics and truths unfurl and interweave to produce other ways to encounter childhood, early years, multiculturalism and what's, going, what's unfolding in these spaces in that moment. And I then conclude by endeavouring to pull at strings that offer a speculative account of what else is going on when we allow ourselves to ask what if, and so work beyond the limitations of what we think we see and what we think we know, beyond the limitations of recognition and representation. Hair and chair. Within seconds of settling onto a too small chair in Ladybird room, two children, let's call them Arna and Elsa, have introduced themselves to me. Arna begins stroking my hair in an inquisitive way. Both girls are black British and have their hair in braided cornrows. They seem preoccupied by the texture, colour and length of my hair and continue lifting and stroking it whilst engaging me in enthusiastic conversation. They tell me their names, that they understand I'm an expert about Christmas. I've been, I've introduced myself as somebody who's coming to observe festivals and events as they unfold within the nursery. So at this time in December, it's, they think I'm an expert about Christmas. And that they're expecting me and really pleased that I have come. McDonald's, church, sequins and Disney princesses. The whole time the girls are making star collages, they talk busily, telling me about their lives, their likes. Elsa tells me that she goes to Christchurch where they sing and are getting ready for Christmas, but the best thing about going is the trip to McDonald's on the way home. I'm asked if I like McDonald's more than Christmas. Do I have a McDonald's near my home? The questions are in quick succession that I barely have a chance to answer which is a relief as I don't like McDonald's and actively avoid going there or discouraging my children from eating McDonald's. But I don't share this with them, rather offer that I think there probably is a McDonald's somewhere near where I live. Elsa then shows me where artwork goes to dry, on a rack in the corner. 
Then she's back at the table gluing another star and talking avidly to me about Disney princesses. They are illustrated on the beakers that hold the sequins they are gluing. A dinner invitation, home corner, chairs, mirrors, domesticity. A little while later, Anna takes my notebook and decides that she is a waitress and takes my food order. Then Elsa comes over and takes the notebook and my pen and begins to write, asking me what day it is. The girls then take it in turns to write on my notebook and appear to have no intention of returning it. Then I'm invited to come to dinner. I am taken over to home corner and I quickly realise that I will not fit in the dining chairs placed around the table that have arms on the sides and are not intended for adult bodies. So I pull up one of the stacking, still two small chairs, and sit on the edge of home corner. My seat is opposite a mirror above a wash basin and to the side of a makeshift wall with a reflective surface. I catch sight of myself and my ridiculously long legs. My knees are almost up my ears as I attempt to fold myself into this other too small chair. I think of Alice in Wonderland as I am offered a plastic chicken to eat. Anna has consulted the food order in my notebook and determines that I ordered cake as well, but we will have to make that from scratch. She brings over a large lump of the green sparkling Play-Doh and jams it into a metal teapot. The cake making and sharing goes on for some time and I am required to sample it. Again, I catch sight of the scene and the reflective surfaces, struck by my adult body in a simulated miniature otherworld a world of domesticity and make-believe, familiar and strange at the same time. Magical realism, cake, candles. Anna and I are regularly consulting about what is real, pretend and magic. I don't have to really, really eat the cake, but I do have to actually, really, blow out the make-believe candles, but not yet because they are not alight. Without verbalising, it's clear that Anna has a bright idea as she springs up from her chair, eyes wide, brows raised. She purposefully scampers off and returns with the empty shaving foam can and applies the foam remaining on the nozzle onto each of the pipe cleaner candles. She can't find the right word, lighter, match, but knows instinctively what the can has become. But soon the foam fire is used up, but not all the candles have been lit. She instructs me to light the rest of the candles, reminding me it's a Christmas cake. It may have candles, but it is not a birthday cake, but a magical Christmas cake. I ask what's magic about it, and I am told that it disappears. Talking gobble. Elsa then rejoins us. She is wearing a purple conical party hat as a unicorn horn and has two boggly eyes still attached to her cheeks. In all seriousness, she begins to chat with me again, asking questions about my home and whether I have a Christmas tree and which decoration is my favourite. Then the conversation moves to her grandparents, two nanas, one granddad. In the few spaces left for me to answer, I attempt to keep up with the shifts in her questioning. They both begin to snort and giggle. Why do you talk like that? Elsa asks. Like what? Different, just different. There's a pause. You talk gobble. That's it. Gobble. I ask what gobble is and it seems that my accent is not like hers or any of the children or the educators. The intonation is not unfamiliar in this North London nursery with its multicultural population. It's gobble and it's funny. Drink me, eat me. Elsa flits off again and Anna has decided that we need a drink to go with our cake. She takes a plastic bottle from the shopping basket, which was once a bottle of nail varnish remover. I have another fleeting Alice-like thought about the potential dangers of drinking toxic substances, but it's clear that this is water to pretend drink. Anna moves over to the hand basin and looks around her using the mirror to scan the room, as if to check that the coast is clear. I suspect she might be breaking certain rules, such as playing with water in a non-designated water playing area. But she is confident and comes back to the table and begins to pour the water into the Disney princess beakers in which small dollops of Play-Doh sit. I am instructed to drink and I pretend to do so. 
Anna returns to the basin several times and then she's caught in the act as she overfills the metal teapot with the water. It trickles over the table and the Play-Doh floats on top of a puddle of water that shouldn't be there. An educator comes over and begins to rehearse the rules about not playing with water in home corner. What a mess. I feel that I'm being included in the gentle reprimand. The brimming um, teapot is taken away and its contents poured down the sink. I spy a concealed look of exasperation in the mirror above the basin. Meanwhile, Anna and I take paper towels from the dispenser and begin absorbing the puddle. The structure of the towels is transformed from stiff, crisp, dry rectangles to soggy, disintegrated, cold, mushy balls. We both sense that this signals the end of the game. So what else? My intention is not to offer a deconstruction or an interpretation of what these moments from research might mean or to identify evidence of multiculturalism in early childhood contexts. Rather, my concern is to grapple with what else gets produced through practices of mutated modest witnessing. Whilst there are clearly human actors within these scenes, Elsa, Anna, myself and the educator, the other non-human and more than human actors work together to produce affects that linger still, confusion, judgment, thrill and musing. I want to argue that such ordinary affects, to borrow from Kathleen Stewart, can be productive in how we come to figure with materiality and affect and affect so as to think more intensely and act more responsibly. Within these scenes, the liveliness of matter, as Jane Bennett terms them, is sensed, and it is possible to trace how various agents, chair, hair, play-doh, water, together with researcher and child bodies, space and time, activate multiple intensities and forces, unpredictable fault lines and energetic currents. Through these entangled encounters, resonances were provoked, memories agitated across and within bodies. For example, Gobble transported me back to previous research situations where social class signifiers such as accent, hairstyle, choice of clothes produced uncomfortable affects. In that Gobble moment, I was transported to other points throughout my own childhood into adulthood that have been marked by uncomfortable affective processes of social mobility. Further, Gobble worked on me to dwell upon the privileged white middle classness that my own children currently inhabit. These strange encounters with routine and everyday happenings in Ladybird Room interrupted and fractured the familiarity of being in a nursery. Having undertaken research in nurseries for over 20 years, there is a predictability and easy recognition of, of the organisation of space, furniture and materials, and indeed play scenarios. Yet taking up the figure of the mutated modest witness makes the simple mundane acts of talking and sitting something else altogether. When bodies are out of place, out of time and excessive, it becomes possible to encounter early childhood education differently. The two small chairs contort adult bodies and therefore insist that researcher sensibilities become reconfigured as mutated modest witnesses in nursery spaces. Sensing and noticing ridiculously long legs whilst embarking upon a feast of plastic chicken generates discomfort and awkwardness. Such sensations insist that I must recognise my emplacement, that I am infected and affected by the extraordinary in early childhood education. In these encounters, matters of fact, including those relating to chairs, accent, play-doh, the texture, length, colour of human hair, interacted with matters of concern and matters of care, which generated resonances and dissonances. This mode of inquiry demands that the researcher be open to the queerness that resides in spaces where habits, magic and fantasy co-mingle with regulation, containment and surveillance. It has been the subject of feminist critique for reinscribing gender stereotypes, yet being open to what else might unfold in this simulated space of domestication, the home corner, offers interesting surprises, if only we're prepared to take up this figure of the mutated modest witness. The vital materialism of the various objects within the space created opportunities for surging capacities to affect and to be affected. 
Within these micro moments, something was released, um, a ceaseless motion of relations, scenes, contingencies and emergencies unfolded. Sensations, expectations, wanderings, memories, habits were set in motion. To be affected in this way provokes endless questions. Questions about children, childhood and life in the Anthropocene and the significance of our worlding practices as they unfold within everyday scenes of Ladybird Room. Practices of mutated modest witnessing demand deep hanging out and a willingness to be immersed and infected by life in child-sized world. Taking up an Alice in Wonderland sensibility, working with the affects of discomfort, awkwardness, excess and being out of place is generative and provides a portal through which to unsettle established ideas about childhood and difference. Such deep immersion unsettles and expands ideas about the ways in which policies, curriculum frameworks and pedagogical practices play out. By focusing on the seemingly unremarkable and routine every day, it becomes possible to attune to our ethical responsibilities anew. Close attention to what unfolds in early childhood contexts can tell us so much about children's place within the world and their participation in world-making practices. Taking up childlike inquisitiveness and curiosity in our research practices and indeed in our pedagogical practices involves a willingness to create alternative, otherworldly, possibly magical stories that are corporeal, sensory and haptic. Affective methodologies such as that offered through mutatus modest witnessing recognises our entangled place. I'm coming towards the end now. Um, so this quote from Stacey Alamo, again, I think is really helpful. The material self cannot be disentangled from networks that are simultaneously economic, political, cultural, scientific and substantial. And that's precisely what I see these moments that I've shared with you being, that they are entangled networks that are economic, political, cultural, scientific. Um, and they what was once an ostensibly bounded human subject finds herself in a swirling landscape of uncertainties. So to conclude, I want to stress that the mutated modest witness is not an innocent bystander gathering representational accounts of the world out there. Rather, she is implicated and invested. And as Kathleen Stewart urges, it is to the productive potential of the everyday, ordinary, habitual, routine and otherwise unremarkable that we need to pay attention. So as my observations attest, early childhood contexts are extraordinarily ordinary, excessive and effectively charged. And what I'm suggesting is that we need to attend to close examination of what these extraordinary moments, objects, materialisations and entanglements might make possible when we consider childhood and how childhoods get produced. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jane. That's fantastic. Um, 